Uh, hello there. Welcome to the Warren and Doug Show. One of the things about game design and game development is that there's a lot of it which happens at 2 in the morning over pizza or in some restaurant when you haven't eaten in days and slept. And these sort of discussions and background somewhat unfocused issues uh, are a lot of what makes game development interesting. And one of the things we talked about at the advisory board this year was, could we get some of that into the actual game design track and out of the hotel rooms? So the question became for us, uh, how do we get it from the uh, hotel room uh, onto the stage? I mean, to be honest with you, the lights are so bright here, I'm not sure I can actually analyze a game. I need darkness. I need to be lying flat on my back. I, I, I should probably be in bed, but uh, we're going to try to do it on the stage. Uh, why this format? Why, why is it two of us up here instead of just one of us gabbing about games? Uh, one of the things that makes those late night discussions so exciting and interesting is the fact that we get into all sorts of amazing arguments. And out of those arguments come new ideas uh, and new ways of looking at games and, and realizations that, you know, oh my God, I can't believe we actually did that or, or why did you do that? And you, you come to all sorts of realizations that you don't come to on your own. Um, so this is a trial, trial run for something that we hope to see more of in the future. Uh, why the two of us? Uh, partly because no one else was foolish enough to try this uh, to see if it would work. Um, but also because we've been working together for 10 or 11 years on a bunch of stuff. And um, the, you know, the, the way I originally worded this is we can brutalize each other and still end up friends. Um, there probably won't be much brutalizing going on today because we're probably going to be way more polite in public than we are in, in private. But, um, but we're... <laughs> We're in general agreement about a lot of things. We disagree about a lot of things. We're going to see if we can get at some of that today. OK, so some brief introductions. My name is Doug Church. I'm a computer scientist by training. I've been doing game design since 1990 at uh, Looking Glass, which wasn't called that at the time. I worked on a bunch of uh, first-person immersive simulation games over the last 10 to 12 years. And I'm Warren Spector. I'm currently the studio director at Ion Storm. You can read all this stuff. And uh, we are joined at the hip. All right. Uh, this is real important to us. You know, we're, we're two guys. This is, this is like my big, my big deal, right? So I'm going to make a pitch at this. And you've you got to believe it. Um, you know, we're not game gods. We're not legends. We're guys who work as part of a team. We are the front men for our bands. Uh, so we, we get a lot of the, the publicity. But we're just the front men. And so here, here's our proof, right? This isn't actually all of the credits, but the slide was getting really small in the text font. Uh, there are a ton of people on this slide, and they were all important parts of Thief. And any game you look at has a credit list kind of like this, and a bunch of people who contributed and were really important, because t games are done by teams. And, and in, if you didn't believe that, here's a part of the Deus Ex credits. Um, again, just a part. There were plenty more people who worked on the game. We're the guys who get to sit up here and talk. Um, but all those folks are responsible for the games that you saw. So there may be a brief question here of what you might learn from this hour that you're wasting here. The hope is that you'll learn some specific design insights into both of these games, because these are the specific games we're going to talk about. That we're going to see some examples of how, although we have very similar goals in a lot of our projects, we often think different approaches are the correct approach to take with varying degrees of certainty. And we're going to do a fair amount of attempted analysis, which will mostly start fairly concrete and hopefully move towards the more abstract and general understanding. Obviously, uh, we'll see how the discussion goes to see if that turns out to be true. Uh, we've also got some meta takeaways. Um, we want to show that you can talk about games, you can be critical of games without being negative. Um, like I said, some of the, some, we, we tend to be a little more negative in private, I suspect, than we're going to be today. But it, but it is important to understand that we are not saying good, bad, uh, but analyzing differences, uh, once we get past all the preamble anyway. Um, we wanted to show that it's possible to talk about how and why games work without destroying the magic. Uh, you're, if you're at my pre-production talk, you understand this is one of my, my themes for the show. The magic of game creation is not destroyed by, by thinking about it and discussing it. Uh, and also that people can agree on overall goals 
uh, but disagree, disagree about uh, how to accomplish them. Speaking um, about this idea of mutual critique of, of game design and trying to get more of that into the show, I, I'd love it if, assuming this goes well and you don't all decide this was a total waste of time, in which case we should probably never do this again, but assuming it does go well, it'd be great to have more of that in the future and get people from some other teams that do similar but different styles or similar but different products to uh, come up here and do similar sorts of things at future GDCs. So let, before we get to actually doing anything, uh, a little more preamble, what, what we're not. One of the, the cool things about this show, uh, this particular year for me, is that several people have, have identified uh, the fact that we're starting to develop uh, some unique, discrete, identifiable um, ways of analyzing games, some schools of thought. It's almost, it's almost like being back in college in a way, in, in a good way. Um, and, and, you know, Doug has been a big proponent along with several other people of formal abstract design tools. Uh, Noah, Noah and, and Hal, Noah Falsey and Hal Barwood have been talking about um, the 400, which you may have been reading, you read about and, and heard about here at the show. There are other people talking about uh, the application of Christopher Alexander's you know, pattern language and the way that's been applied to the software engineering and now how we can apply it to games. All that stuff is really cool. Uh, personally, I'm going to try and, and see if we can get more discussion of that in a very direct way next year, but not this year, not at this show, uh, not at this uh, talk, I should say. So basically, we're just going to pose and discuss, which I think should be the theme for next year's show, by the way. We're going to pose and discuss a set of questions, and we're going to see what happens. You know, hopefully it'll work out. Okay, and just to keep things exciting, I'm going to give a brief overview of Thief. Doug's going to give a brief overview of Deus Ex. I'm going to assume that, that you guys are familiar enough with these games, and that's why you're here. So I'm not going to go into too much detail. Um, as I started to think about what I wanted to say about Thief in, in the minute I have to give my five-minute analysis here, um, I, you know, I, most people probably expect you to start with, you're Garrett, you're a thief in a dark city, the pagans, that, you know. That's not the way I think about Thief. Uh, when I think about Thief, the, the important things are uh, mission-based, first-person perspective, action game, uh, razor-sharp focus, uh, on stealth minimalism. Uh, Thief is a game that's all about the player's interaction with the world. Uh, and even though you play a character called Garrett, the real star is you uh, and how you interact with the world. Uh, there's a bunch of other stuff. I probably ought to just zip through this. And we should. Okay, I'm just going to go. All right. Um, other elements of Thief that, that are critical to, to me and my appreciation of it anyway are, are the... Uh, some compelling AI. It's unbelievable. It, it taught me a lot about uh, AI as a foil for the player, as a way to make the player feel cool and powerful uh, and not a way to defeat the player. Valuable lesson that, you know, I should have learned 12 years ago but didn't. Um, the, uh, the audio in Thief is absolutely state-of-the-art. I mean, it's almost a character uh, in the game itself. Um, there is a unique fiction and setting, um, but let's, let's not even go there. Uh, and unique and deeply simulated gameplay, simulation at a level that is very rare in games, um, and basically an entirely new kind of game cloaked in very familiar garb. So looking at Deus Ex, one also starts with a mission-based first-person action game. In Deus Ex, however, there's a real focus on sort of an expansive fiction and and a large scale of possibility and threads of story and threads of focus. There's a lot going on in the game, and you're sort of bouncing between a bunch of different contexts and roles. That, that partially follows from the fact that there's a sort of a blending of genres there, where there are parts of the game where you're playing sort of a strategy spatial game, and parts of the game where you're playing an action shooter game, and parts where you're playing an RPG inventory skill management game. And you can bounce between those genres as you bounce between the different contexts. And that provides you a lot of flexibility with where you choose to invest yourself in the game and where you choose to sort of not pay attention and let that part of the game do its own thing. That diversity um, works partially because there's a, there's a whole suite of small scale choices you as a character get to make both in terms of, oh, do I get this item or this item? Which do I keep in my inventory? 
where do I take my skill upgrade? What augmentation do I use? What do I say in this conversation? Do I fight or flee? There's a lot of ways that you get to make choices that impact in the small who you are and where you're going. And that character growth tied into that means that although the, the sort of game goes in this one direction and you as J.C. Denton essentially follow, that you get a lot of say in how you approach that process and you feel very involved. You, you get frequent times to sort of chime in with an opinion about yourself as the game moves on. Okay, so now we're actually going to start the talk. It took like 10 <laughs> minutes. That's not bad for us. Uh, Thief is very clear in that the narrative is in the cutscenes and the gameplay is in the game. And there you are in the game sneaking around and very little narrative occurs there. Most of the narrative is out between the missions, completely out of the players, players watching the narrative. DX threads it, as I was just saying, all through the game. You're continually getting little bits of narrative from characters, books, whatever. It's always popping little bits into whatever situation is going on. In neither game do we give you much control over that narrative. One could write the one-page summary of the plot of either game just fine, and it would read right for pretty much every player who ever played it. So given that there aren't any affordances for the player directly impacting the narrative, why is so much of the narrative in Deus Ex put down there in the game where the player gets to see it and it's right in their face, but they don't actually get to do anything with it. Okay, hit, hit me below the belt with the first question. Um, a lot of, there's gonna be another recurring theme in this talk. Um, a, a lot of what made, I feel like I should be looking at it. A lot of what made Deus Ex work, um, or what it was, was, was frankly frustration with Thief. Um, I'm going to give the, the backstory here so I don't have to do it 14 times uh, in, in the, the rest of the 45 minutes. Um, you know, I, I, was, I was the producer of Thief for one year out of its, you know, however many months or years uh, development. And it, it, it was so minimal in its approach um, that uh, I, I got kind of frustrated with it. And in Deus Ex, in, in this context in particular, in the context of how we express the narrative, um, I, I was thinking that you know, when you're in the game, um, the fact that you can't interact with any of the people, uh, that you have to play the way the, the, the designers essentially intended you to play, I found that, that very constraining, I guess. Uh, I anticipated that it would be constraining for players. As it turned out, obviously, I, I, was, I was wrong, and players really dig on Thief and its, and its minimal uh, approach to things. But um, what we wanted to do was bring together uh, a variety of things, to give players multiple points of access to all aspects of the game. We didn't want to dictate to the players. And that meant, to me, uh, bringing out some of the action elements of it, which in which in, in ways that are somewhat similar to Thief, uh, some stealth elements that are in some ways similar to Thief, but also many role-playing elements. Um, and role-playing elements uh, involve um, inventory management, object manipulation, uh, and uh, conversation. And the way Deus Ex presents its narrative in the context of, of the missions and in the context of the gameplay is largely through interaction with the characters, okay, through conversation. Um, and, and in the way that Thief was very passive in that regard, you could overhear things, but you could never interrupt. You, could, you never had that level of interaction with, with any element of the backstory or the, the story you were engaged in. Um, we wanted to get beyond that, or not beyond that, that's the only way to put it. We wanted to get around that in Deus Ex. And so we wanted to, to uh, include fairly conventional role-playing style conversation. Okay. Right, but so, so I guess the question I have is, if you're going to do that, but at the same time you know that you're not actually letting the player impact it, except in these small choices we, I was briefly talking about in terms of how it lets you grow your character, how do you do that in such a way that you don't, you know, how do you, how do you build that so that the inclusion of narrative there doesn't confuse? Right. I, I, 
I guess um, I, I would, I would kind of disagree with the, the statement that you don't get to impact things. I mean, the, the conversations react to, uh, to how you're interacting with the world uh, and, and give you feedback about how you're interacting with, uh, w interacting with the narrative. It tells you your place in the narrative, even if you can't change that. Um, but also, um, it, it, it sort of propels you through the narrative. It, it gives you the next step. Um, it gives you the information you need to keep going forward. It tells you who these people are. Um, so, it, so it's sort of a way to, to make the narrative more immediate and moment to moment and include more of it at more frequent Exactly. Periods throughout the game everything and, and thread it. Everything about Deus Ex is minute to minute. I mean, it, you know, I've, I've, said, I've said before, Deus Ex is a game where, where we wanted to be very clear. It, it, frankly, I mean, in a lot of the same ways that Thief was clear, we wanted to be really clear that, you know, we own this part, player. This is ours. Don't even try to screw with this. And this is the part that you own. And we were able to give the, and th that part that the player owns is that minute to minute. It's the little stuff. And so you do have little impact. You do have little impact. That came out wrong. You, small you, impact. You have, you have impact in, in, in over the small things, even in the context of, of the conversations and, and the way the narrative is presented to you, even if you can't ever say, no, I'm, I'm going to stay with you, Natka. Sure, okay. So, sure. so you're saying basically that by including that, that element of small inclusion, it, it involves the player in the large thing without confusing them that they actually have control over the large. Right, and, okay. and another element, another thing we're going to be talking about a lot when we run out of time on the first slide um, is, is the power of illusion. I mean, giving player control over little things uh, sort of sets the stage for them to imagine that they are more in control of bigger things. And smoke and mirrors are... What know, we do for a living. Holy cow. Yeah. Okay, so here, here was another thing that drove a lot of what Deus Ex is. It, it drove me up a wall listening in on, on uh, design conversations uh, while well, Thief was in development, um, about why, why you can't fight your way through a Thief mission. I mean, if I'm not good enough, you know, I ha as a player, to get past an obstacle, a combat obstacle, uh, I have two choices in most games. I can throw the game away out of frustration, or, well, I guess that's my only option. Um, but Thief really does a great job of, of of balancing this, I mean, of, of keeping you right on the, on, on the razor's edge of tension. I mean, that's, that's where Thief makes its meaning, I guess. You know, it, it's like there's this, this, this razor-sharp edge where you're not quite discovered, you're not quite, not quite unseen, and you're really tense. I mean, it's just such a, a tense game. Um, but how do, you, how do you maintain that balance, and how do you prevent it from becoming a game of, I'm going to wait until I'm completely safe, or I'm going to run out there and fight. Oh, wait, I can't. Looking at, uh, looking at the spectrum of player, player's position in Thief, you're anywhere from I'm safe, I'm in a pitch dark room, all the doors are locked, you know, I can't hear a single noise, and I have everything in my inventory, nothing can go wrong, to I'm in a brightly lit hallway surrounded by guys with their swords out. Clearly, neither of those is particularly interesting. And as Warren says, there is this edge in the middle where you're about to be discovered. The footsteps are just coming down the hall. The door, you just hear the handle. You know, like, it's about to happen. What am I going to do? And in a lot of ways, Thief as a game design is a game about taking what is actually this spectrum where there's sort of this tiny little interesting region surrounded by two not very interesting regions and trying to pull that center out to this edges as far as we can. So that rather than, oh, I'm safe, I'm safe, I'm safe, whoops, I'm, the guy saw me and now I'm doomed. It's, I'm safe, hey, I think I heard some footsteps, hmm, that's a little dangerous. Oh, I heard some guys talking, that might be a little more dangerous. Oh, there's a light going on and off, that must mean there's lights nearby, maybe I better worry about my space. Try and come with more ways to have a little bit of tension. And somewhere on the other side, more ways to recover as you start going in past that line. A lot of Thieves' AI work is done... Thieves are foils, as Warren said. We're not... The Thief AI isn't trying to win, because if, if the Thief AI decided it wanted to win, it would win all the time. The Thief AI is there to give you a set of challenges to overcome in a structured simulation environment that you can think about and trust and learn to, over, to, to, to deal with. So. So that edge of tension really works by not making it an edge anymore. 
you know, teaching the AI to wait, teaching the AI to go, I think I heard something. Pause, pause, pause. Wow, I better go investigate. Pause, pause, pause. I'm heading over there now, and things like that. Footsteps are very, very, very loud. So that you can hear them from a long way off and get worried about them. You know, there's a lot of stuff like that in the game to expand that region. And so that was one of the main goals. As to the second part, unless you want to interrupt me briefly. I want to interrupt you briefly. Go right ahead. OK. Um, so there, there's a critical point in there. This is more a comment, I guess, than a question. But um, one of the things that we talk about a lot, we, we talked about a lot at, at, at Looking Glass, obviously, and we talk about a lot at, at ION, is um, how important feedback is. And it's something that, that so many games seem to fail at. I mean, it's the, the, the bullet that comes out of nowhere to kill you, uh, that just flat wouldn't work in Thief. I mean, there's no way that would work. It does, I'm not sure it works in any game, to be honest. But it clearly wouldn't work in Thief. Um, so it might be interesting to talk a little bit about feedback strategies in Thief. I mean, we certainly think about them in Deus Ex. But anyway, that's the one thing, that, a potential thing to talk about. And the other is, um, how, how, if, if you can even get to this in five, we digress a lot. Did you notice that? Um, it, was the geometry conceived and built in such a way as to broaden that, that edge? Or, or, did that, or, or did you just introduce enough feedback into spaces that were not created for that purpose to overcome limitations? OK. Uh, to the geometry question first, while I remember it, one of the early got them written analysis down. docs written about Thief was actually written by Tim Stelmach, uh, who is the, the sort of main designer on the project. And one of Tim's first documents was about viewing Thief as a strategy game in which you vied for control of the territory. And that at any given time, any part of the territory could be conceived as garrets, the oppositions, or in flux. And by moving the AIs around, by controlling lines of sight, by controlling where we place the lights that can be turned on and off, and to some degree controlling where we had very loud floors or other things that were hard to be quiet on, we had a lot of control over when that environmental space was changeable, how static and safe it could really be, and how that interaction drove the player's actions. And so a lot of Thief's mission design was really based around this structure of, hey, we've got to have long sight lines here so that it can't be too safe. We've got to have some lights that can't go away so it can't be too safe. Hey, this area would be a good place for the player to just camp out. Got to make sure we send some AIs through there on patrols that take them up through a noisy, lit area so the player has a chance to react. And at some level, that comes back to this final question on the slide, which is, the way you make it fun is you do your best to make sure that when you're standing and waiting, you're either feeling like you're about to do something cool, i.e., the second that guy turns around, I'm going to bonk him on the back of the head, which really may not be the coolest thing in the world, but it's kind of fun when it works. Or I just snuck past him, and I know he's looking for me, and I just got to wait another couple seconds, and oh, must have been a rat. Yup, he's lost me. And that moment of closure on stealth was a crucial part of keeping this, as, keeping this a game that, that actually resolved ever. You know, a game where you sneak past everything is sort of a game where you never interact with the game. Oops. And this is something we talked about a lot on Thief, as you might imagine. Um, a game which encourages you to not move and to not interact does miss some of the elements that traditionally work in gaming. Uh, so let, let me jump in there. Yes. Actually, at, at Origin, many, many years ago, uh, I remember the, the, uh, the VP of marketing and the sales guy came to us uh, with the idea of doing a game about an invisible man, you know, whose whole goal was to avoid being caught and seen and everything. And, and everybody, me, Richard Garrett, Chris Robert, I mean, everybody, we all said, Oh yeah, you guys don't know what you're talking about. The, that's not a game. There's no game there. A, a game that encourages you not to interact. What the heck? And, and of course, they came along and showed that we were wrong, and the marketing and sales guys were right. But don't tell them. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, those moments of closure are critical to Thief. The fact that you don't you defeat a guard often not by beating them up, but by hearing them say, "Oh, it must have been nothing," and that has to be a moment of closure. And that means we have to provoke you into situations where you have to get that moment of closure. And that's where 
you know, I was talking about the, the front side of that equation where we try to have lights moving and guards moving and noise propagating, so you start feeling edgy before the real edge. And on the other side of that, we have things like, I lost him, and hey, what was that? And oh, I, I must have been something else to take the other edge and push it further away so that there's more slop space for the player. There's more space for the player to be detected but not really be in trouble. And further, there's this moment of closure where you say, yes, I won. Although I didn't fight, although I waited a bit and watched, and then I made my little move, and then I waited some more, I won. That was me winning my encounter. Getting, I made a plan, I saw the situation, I did what I wanted to do, and it got me what I wanted. And that moment of closure is crucial. The game is not the same without it. And, and so the combination of having closure and then provoking situations where we get into that edge that we've stretched out is the way we try to keep it from being a game about standing still. And the way that we use this, I, Tim's idea of the, the environment as a strategy surface where you're fighting over control of territory, where control means safety, into the central theme of the level design and, and the player's experience, even if the player never conceptualizes it as that. Because ideally, they don't have to read our stupid internal documentation to enjoy the game. Uh, uh, hold on. Um, OK. The, the idea of, of, of the game as a strategy game, almost, of taking territory is really, really cool. And to bring it back to the why, why can't I fight my way through a thief mission, I was having this discussion. Oh, I that question. Go on. I was having this discussion with a programmer who now works at Ion Storm, who worked on Thief 2. And he, he brought that up. He mentioned that, that it's a game of taking territory and of, of giving territory with combat as, the, as only a recovery option. Um, I wanted to talk about the, the ter forget about the recovery option, the fight thing is, this is a boring question. But um, the territory thing is, is really interesting to me. How did you, how did you create it, how, how did you, you guys, how did the team create the map, the maps so you didn't feel frustrated at having to give up so much territory to recover from one little failure? Right, well, I will say one sentence on the first sentence of the slide, which is, the reason you can't fight your way through is because then we don't have any control over that edge. If we can't threaten you, and obviously a very good player can fight their way through and sort of play this different game, which is the I'm so good I can beat the game game, which is fine. But for, for most players, the goal is that it has to be hard enough that we can keep you in that tense area. That when things go wrong, you do say, oh no, what am I going to do about it? How do I avoid it? Not, oh well, I guess I'll just have to get rid of these six guys. The way that plays into the territory thing is because, because combat is sort of a last resort and it's not a focus, and because we try to create these environments which are very overconnected and very, you know, sort of, there are many approaches. Since we're not doing much explicitly in the level, you know, there isn't a lot of very specific go through these 28 doors in sequence pressing buttons to get to where you're going in Thief. The player really can take a large number of routes to their space. At some level, we viewed the giving up as territory as a requirement for you to go find some other place in the level and learn about it. And so at some level, our hope, which we succeeded at to varying degrees in that game-like way, was that with enough potential in the level for players to make their own way, the response to what, to a losing situation, to, to being pushed so far past that edge that it's not just hide in the corner for a second, it's run and panic and get yourself lost and run down some hallway you haven't even been down before is, okay, at least I'm not being beaten up anymore, but where am I <laughs> and what am I supposed to do next? And a lot of the sort of vagary of Thief, and this worked and didn't work for various people and in various levels, was an attempt to make it so that your, your that the environment was full of challenges and surprises and forced you to dynamically react, not statically solve the level, and then be able to do it again and again. And that's why so much of the AI pathing and where they go at various times is so simulation and so non-specific in the engine. I mean, not that you couldn't do it specifically, but in the specific missions that were built, the goal was to stay away from that as much as possible. So in a recovery situation, it's not, well, I blew my chance because that was the way in. It's like, well, that way is not going to work anymore because there are a bunch of guards there. <laughs> you know, I hid some guy's body in a closet. It's a nightmare. I don't want to go back there. Uh, 
I guess that's not, you know, I'm going to have to go explore some more and find some other way to get to my goal. And ideally, which I think we're, you know, more successful at than not, um, there's some other approach you can go take at that point. I, I could ask 10 more questions, but we better go because we only have, you know, a certain <laughs> amount of time here. We're on the second question. Come on, we only have 12. <laughs> This is my question, which I'm trying to decide if we've already discussed or not. I, I actually want to speak to it briefly. Do you want to just answer it? They can read it. OK, you can read this. Um, yeah, there, there's a real tension in, in um, the creation of an immersive simulation game about pre-scripted sequences versus uh, simulation-driven experience. And in an ideal world, uh, I think everyone on the Deus Ex, almost everyone on the Deus Ex team would have and would now argue that, that the simulation-driven experience is way more powerful because it's totally in, it, it, under player control. Um, you have some tools, you have some skill as a player, you have a world, a problem, how do you want to solve it? That was clearly what Deus Ex was all about. But, but here's the deep, dark secret, and I'm only telling you all this because you're, you're like game developers and you're not going to go blabbing this on Fat Babies or something. Um, you know, much of Deus Ex was fake, right? Um, we, we did some simulation, more than a lot of games, and we certainly saw some, some emergent gameplay situations that grew out of our simulation, but much of the gameplay, much of what people perceived as the depth of, of multiple solutions was as hard-coded as, as anything in an Ultima game or, well, any other game you want to mention, okay? Um, and, and here was the frustration, uh, both ways. Some of the, the most memorable parts of Deus Ex uh, were, were some of the most heavily scripted and the most heavily hand-crafted by a designer. Uh, in much the same way that if you've played, you know, okay, you've all played Half-Life, what am I talking about? In Half-Life, you know, everybody remembers the, the amazing moments that were created by the designers and which you all had. You all experienced them individually. Right, but you all had the same experience. Um, the canonical example for us, and something we talk about a lot in terms of thinking about our future projects, is, is um, Mission 6, Hong Kong. Um, I bet if I ask, I'm not asking because I can't see a thing out there, by the way, but um, if I ask for a show of hands, I bet half the people who played Deus Ex would say Hong Kong was the coolest mission in the game. And I bet the other half would say, wow, Hong Kong was totally broken for me. And that's specifically because the designer of that mission, Steve Powers, absolutely brilliant, brilliant creator of, of wonderful moments. But he was the creator of many of those moments. And, and when we, we, just, we just finished the PS2 version, and in, in breaking up the maps that made up Hong Kong, we broke that mission so badly because it was so fragile, because the little things that we had stitched together, that Steve in particular had stitched together, were so elegant and so much a part of the structure of the maps and of the placement of every single item and the setting of every single flag. I mean, it was so fragile that when we pulled it apart to, to recreate it in a new form, it, it, it broke. And we spent, we, we went five months late on the project, uh, and, and I bet three of them were spent fixing that one mission. Now, we fixed it, and it's, it's as wonderful as in, and, and as compelling as it was before, but that's one of the problems, especially as we get into a new era. I mean, I realize I'm getting into sort of production and stuff, but you know, the, the, the amount of content required now and the, the quality of the content required is so great uh, as we move into a new era of more powerful hardware that I think we all have to be thinking about that problem, the Mission 6 problem. I have to write an article about the Mission 6 problem. You know, where, where pre-planning everything at that level makes things so fragile that, and, and takes so much time that we're just not going to have time to do it. So we have to find other ways to deal with it. Do you think that, that part of it is that players are looking to understand their choices and that one of the reasons that's popular with people is because they can sort of see that, hey, I'm on something and this is one of the cool parts of the game I should be fulfilling? Or do you think it's simply that players, or, or do you think it's a, I, I want to see the whole game, I want to be a completist? I don't think it's... I, Okay, I clearly think that, that many, if not most, players want to be completist, which gets to a whole Another other range yes. of questions. Fine. Um, but I think in, in this case, uh, I think it's comfort more than anything else. I think, 
I think it's that mission six, uh, and again, it was one of my favorite missions too, so let, don't misunderstand anything I'm saying here. Um, it, it felt much more like a traditional game mission. Uh, and people just got it. They understood it. They didn't, they didn't stand there in the middle of a, of a map and go, oh, what do I do? I can do anything? You know? And I think that was part of the power of it. Yep. All right. As I played, played through Thief the first time, and I, I, I was struck by the fact that um, I, I didn't feel any more powerful at the end of the game than I did at the beginning. And, and that, that strikes me as a very odd way to structure a game. Um, you know, in most games, there's a power curve, there's a difficulty curve that's matched by the power curve of the player, right? Uh, or of the character. Um, and rather than belabor the point, I'm just going to ask the question, I mean, how is that implemented? And, and how do you balance something when the, the player character doesn't change in any significant way from start to finish? There is a difficulty curve in Thief. As we were talking about earlier, Thief is a very environmentally focused game, and therefore most of the difficulty curve is implemented through the environment. The sensory cones, all Thief AIs, has these five overlapping cones with sensitivities and yada, 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 detail, detail. Those ramp pretty significantly between the, the guards, you, you know, the drunk guards you have to overcome in mission one and the not so drunk enemies you have to overcome near the end of the game. Uh, they're, they're much more forgiving at the beginning. They're, they spend a lot longer before they really decide they're upset with you or that they really decide they've seen something. Similarly, of course, the later missions just have more guards on longer patrols and more lights that can't go away, longer sight lines, more obscure sight lines, more connectivity. More connectivity is sort of a two-edged sword because an experienced player, that's, you know, as you get better at the game, that helps you out as well. Thief is a very player-driven game. You know, if I, if I play through Thief on Expert and am ready to win, and I give you my character and you get to play level one, and you've never played Thief before, it's not going to help you out very much. If Warren plays through Deus Ex as JC Denton and wins the game, and gives me, or you, gives someone who hasn't played Deus Ex his JC Denton from the end of the game, they're not going to have much trouble with mission one. They're going to have a lot of gear and a lot of augmentations and a lot of power. And even not being very good at the game, the character skill growth is clearly enough to overcome most of the first mission's obstacles. So there's a fundamental difference between the two games there. And in Thief, that was a conscious decision because in the same way we wanted the difficulty curve to be built into the environment, we wanted the, the skill growth curve to be built into the player. Part of that's the whole re rationale be behind expert difficulty being that you're not allowed to kill anyone. Because we viewed the three difficulty levels, right? The difficulty levels aren't implemented by like radically changing. I mean, there's slight tweaks to skills. Last I checked, there were slight to, you know, changes in how we deal with skills and you know, hit points and damage and that sort of thing. But the primary differences between the difficulty levels are what you have to accomplish and how hard that is to accomplish in the actual mission. So we envision that a player has to get pretty good at the game to go back and try mission one again on expert because they have to sort of have a different, more advanced skill set as a human, not a different Garrett who somehow has better inventory items. Balance is always a problem. <laughs> as many people who played Thief have told us. There are times where I think it works really well. Mostly it's infinite play test and a lot of looking at where problems occurred, a lot of black, you know, sort of taking a given creature and playing around with just it in a little test bed and seeing how that went. We, um, yeah, we, we tested like crazy and had no really formal you know, we had whiteboards full of these are how the curves will get better and these are how the player will get better, but it's not, we didn't have a science there that I could articulate as, you know, effective other than test. Uh, I, I want to I wanna jump in here and actually talk about Deus Ex. I mean, it, it, Deus Ex is, um, is a very different game and it is very character driven as opposed to player driven uh, by design again. Um, we, we did want to give people something familiar to grab onto but, but the interesting thing is, and this, this relates both to difficulty curves and character versus player-driven games and balance, um, we had some, some mutant playtesters um, 
and we forced them to play through the game in, in the most radical ways we could think of. Um, we had, I mean, one guy recently on the PS2 version played through the game without ever drawing a weapon. Not, that's not a non-lethal playthrough. That's not ever, not, that doesn't mean just not killing anybody. Never drew a weapon. I didn't even know that was possible. Um, we had testers, on, when we did the PC version, play through without ever installing an augmentation. We had players go through, uh, we had testers go through without ever in, uh, increasing a skill level. And we, we figured if we, were, if we were playable, maybe not fun, frankly, but if we were playable at those extremes, then anything in the middle was going to be okay, too. But, but even as, as character-driven as the game is, and as consciously more difficult uh, as the game progressed as it was, it, it's, still, it's still interesting to me that you can play Deus Ex as a, as a player-driven experience. Now, the difference is, of course, it's not tuned for that, and so it's not much fun. But, but that still strikes me as interesting. Right. I mean, I, I didn't even really think about it in those terms until this what, now. What's in, you know, on Underworld 1, one of our testers played the game in 42 minutes, start to finish, no cheats. Um, he played the game a lot, obviously, yep. before Kevin he got to that. That would be Kevin Wasserman, yes, before he got to that point. But you know, there is sort of this whole other thing. I mean, Underworld was obviously an incredibly character-based game, though it had some player elements. But certainly, you know, he never bothered to use any of his, any, I mean, he just finished the game as fast as possible, which all relied on player skill and making crazy jumps and using items in weird ways. And there is sort of this interesting space is that if you build a rich enough simulation environment where you're not gating the player continuously and you're not hard coding your, your balance situation to in a very specific, like this boss requires this exact weapon with this sort of setup, you do enable players to sort of hack the game and play it to their own, to their own high score list or their own goals as opposed to necessarily the ones you articulated for their you know, initial experience with it. And that's sort of what you're tried, we tried to do with Expert Difficulty and Thief, was say, okay, a lot of us are kind of doing that anyway. Why don't we just do it for real and keep track of it? We could talk all day on any one of these. Okay. This sort of gets back to my central line of questioning here, which is... <laughs> Yeah, my, my short answer is I think we've already kind of talked about yeah, it. Yeah, so maybe we just, do you want to blow it off? Let's just blow it we off. Have we, have we, have, we have 12 minutes. There, let's go. Never mind. Um, okay. Which one is this? Oh, yeah, okay. Here's another thing that frustrates the heck out of me about, about these. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to present this in the context of a Deus Ex discussion, just because I can. Um, it, in Deus Ex, we were, we were scrupulous. We had lots of arguments about this, but we were scrupulous about not just giving you clear, clear high-level goals. You know, here's what the mission's about. JC, um, but also, here's what you're doing right now. If there was ever a point where the player, if we ever saw a tester say, I don't know what to do right now, we went back in and fixed it, okay? Um, and in Thief, I start a mission with so little information. It's steal this thing from this place, and I'm given a map that has so little detail and doesn't change, and I'm only rarely given more information that I, can, that I can go back and check and test you know, against my, my view of the, the world I'm, I'm in. Uh, that, your mic. No, you're fine. No, I, I, I'm still mic. Um, I often feel frustrated by that because I just, I just need more information. I need more information not just to know what I'm doing, but where I'm going, how close I am to my goal, and whether, whether it's in my best interest to start using some of those resources that I've been hoarding. Ah, uh, yes, the inventory discussion. The inventory discussion. It's, Thief did this deliberately. Not that it was not discussed. So, yeah. um, Not that it wasn't discussed endlessly and worried about endlessly. Is the mic still gone? I couldn't tell what you said. Life is good. We go forward. Okay. That was a deliberate decision in Thief. It was a deliberate decision that was reached with much angst and team dissent and chaos. This is where I'd be far less kind to him if we were in private. Um, yes. <laughs> but the reason, the reason that decision was made gets back to our early discussion about environment, which is we wanted this to be a game where we put you in an environment, you were immersed in that environment, and you were forced to dynamically react to what occurred. 
we did not want this to be a game where with full knowledge of a map and a situation and, you know, these corners have red highlights to show you that they're dangerous and these are blue to show you they're safe and these are orange to show you that it's a good way to get to the treasure. You said, hmm, I have three fire arrows and two rope arrows and let's see, there's a little pink thing there so that must be where I can climb so I guess if I use two here and one there, like, we didn't want that game. We did not, Thief has a strategy of using the space but we wanted the strategic elements of using the space to be in the moment of being there down on the ground, seeing the torches flickering and hearing the footsteps coming down the hall. Not in a meta space of, I've precisely plotted something. So what we wanted to give you the experience of, of, which obviously in certain cases we didn't do so well, was to give you just enough information to formulate some initial plan of attack. Some initial plan, for some players that means, I think I know what I'm th gonna do. I think I'm gonna try to go through this way and figure out what's there. For other players it means, go gather a ton of information because I'm so uncomfortable with how little I know. I want more information before I really make a plan. My plan is to get a plan. But we wanted it to be about how the player wanted to approach the situation and not say, don't worry, don't worry, we're gonna tell you when to use your stuff. We're gonna tell you where the right place to go is. It's, we wanted the designer out of the way. And, and, the, and the idea there when it, in concept, perhaps not in implementation, <laughs> was to give you just enough information to decide how you wanted to go investigate. And then what you decide whether you were someone who was gonna boldly stride into the room and assume that whatever went wrong you could trick your way out of it, or whether you're the sort of player who, you know, scouted everything and looked into every possible corner and checked everything out and then went back and thought about it and then did your move. So it was an attempt to let players express their style in terms of how risky they wanted to be and how, what sort of problem solver they were, what sort of approach, and that's why it was so important that spaces were overconnected, and that from a given space you could see a lot of the rest of the level, that you could hear a lot of the rest of the level, and that you could make decisions from the first person view about where you felt safe and where you felt unsafe. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, I have about 47 <laughs> comments and we have eight minutes to go. Um, this is a little fast, I think we have nine and a half minutes. Awesome. Um, okay. Uh, I, we may be arguing about whether whether we're talking about you know one or two on a scale of ten here, so I don't want to go too far. But I mean, I'm just I'm just looking for a little more direction on how how big this mission is. I mean, I don't know if I'm five steps away from stumbling onto my goal because the map doesn't give me enough information, uh, and I don't know how big the mission is, or and I, boy, do I stumble on my goals far too often. It seems. But anyway. Um, or just some general difficulty information like, hey, the barracks are full of bad guys. You might want to avoid that. Yeah, and I think, I think in retrospect, that's sort of the crucial lesson there is that we needed to come up with more ways to give player planning information that didn't, didn't destroy the fact that they had to use that information in a minute-to-minute -minute context, not a pre-planning troop resource RTSE context. Yes, I'm not saying that there's a pink thing I can fire a, a rope barrel in. I mean, I'm just looking for some guidance here, pal. <laughs> you know, the other thing, and I'm not going to let you off the hook on the interface thing either, the inventory thing, I'm sorry, is that um, I'd be less upset about this if, if you had replenished my inventory occasionally. I mean, or, or, or consistently. Clearly, there are some places where you can find more water arrows, you can find more fire arrows. Um, but it's so inconsistently applied within each mission, let alone between missions, you know, I don't know if it, this is the time to use my flash bomb or not. Right. I have no way of determining right. that. Well, and, and, and getting back. It's a player-driven game about consequence and intentionality, and it's like. But con doesn't consequence different. require the player to make choices that they cannot know the, like, if, if we tell yeah, you everything about it, then it's not strategy. They have to be informed, to be informed choices. Yes. I, I think, once again, this is a thing where the correct level of information was hard. We did not come up with the best ways to give a correct level of information, because because for inventory, inventory we very specifically didn't want people hoarding. We very specifically wanted to encourage them to use their stuff and run out of it. Which is a problem in games because players are incredibly used to carrying things forever. And in, we talked earlier about character versus player driven and one of the things you will notice in most player skill driven games, at least most that I can think of, is that inventory and power ups are usually very short term. You know, in Quake, you don't get to keep all your power-ups and then use them when you want. 
You know, you don't get to collect 48 quad damages and save them all for the final boss. That's not how it works. And that's true of most games of that style. When the player's skill is the central tuning element and the central way in which the game mechanic applies, most power-ups, inventory, and specials are very focused in scope so that the player skill doesn't become overwhelmed by their use of inventory or power-ups. And maybe they get a brief chance or a couple fire arrows, but you don't get this like, oh, endless raft of them you get to use whenever you want. And we were very worried about making sure that since this had some RPG trappings, a la inventory, a la fantasy goofy story, we didn't want players to just start assuming, oh, we better keep all our stuff. I'm supposed to just keep all the stuff to the end of the game, and my score is how many extra, you know, level one healing potions I have. Or, you know, the Final Fantasy, I have 8,000 inventory items at the end of the game from back when I was third level and didn't use them. And so that was sort of what we were trying to get at. I don't know what the right way to get at telling you when to use them because it depends completely on your play style. I mean, if I'm the sort of guy who wants to distract a bunch of guards to one region, maybe I want to fire a bunch of fire arrows into the barracks, get every alarms ringing, everyone running over there, and in the huge ensuing chaos, even though I'm out of stuff, go run over and steal the thing. Right, but if I have no way of knowing that the barracks are, are, over, are full of guards, I can't say, oh, I want to... That's why you're supposed to scout the barracks. That's why you're supposed to scout the barracks. <laughs> um, once again, I think this sort of ties into the previous discussion about uh, where in the... Yeah, go ahead. You see when we talk about that? I think we skipped that right there. I thought we talked about that already. Sure, talk about it. Well, except for, I, I've already talked about it. Go okay, on. go ahead. Pick a question. Pick a question, any question. Well, do you want to talk about, this is what we were talking about in terms of AIs moving around and stuff. So. Sure, okay. This is what we were just Which, talking about. Maybe we can actually get to our ending. I mean, we have like four minutes. We could actually do our ending. We could. That's a bad one. Do you want to talk about this one real quick? Um, no, it doesn't sound like Go ahead. <laughs> no, whatever. Um, <laughs> hey, okay. Part of, part of Deus Ex's strength is that we tried to give... Um, this is so goofy. We're out of time. I can't believe it. Um, okay. We tried to give players as many ways to access the game, to, to come at the game as we could. As we could okay? That was its, its whole reason for being uh, in the end. I mean, we started out with, with some different goals. We, we refocused and rethought and re reformatted our brains and came up, you know, filled it up with new data uh, several times during development. Uh, and clearly the story is important. Uh, clearly all of the... Um, Oh, I don't know. You know, all the strategy game. If we, what we wanted to do was give the say, "Hey, you're a role player. We got something for you. Hey, you're a, you're a, a, an action gamer. You're a shooter fan. We got something for you. Hey, you're a sneaky guy. We got something for you too." Um, and we realized here's another big confession. I mean, we, we the reason I personally anyway was so nervous. I won't speak for anybody else on the team, but I was dying when we signed off the game and shipped it because I had no idea if people would respond to that. Um, if, they, if they said, wow, the combat model isn't as, as cool as, you know, Quake or uh, Unreal or, or Half-Life. And, you know, the, and if other people said, wow, you know, I can't sneak the way I can in Thief. And if people said, role-playing? This isn't role-playing. Give me Baldur's Gate, you know. If they said any of those, we were dead. We lost them. But if they said, hey, I get to choose? I get to decide how to play the game, I win. That's the strength of Deus Ex. I mean, it, 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 it's nothing else. It's not the depth of simulation. It isn't even the multiple solutions. It was the multiple ways of accessing the game, right? Thief, on the other hand, is that, I mean, it is starkly minimal in every way. Everything is honed out of that game to get at one thing. What do, you, do you lose anything by doing that? Yeah, I mean, Thief started as a big story character game with, plots and all sorts of crazy other stuff going on in a much bigger environment and got, missions got cut away and honed and we finally realized that the only things we knew, we thought we could actually do were the stealthy parts and if we were just going to do a thing about stealthy stuff, why not do Thief? The, the big thing we got out of that was we got to really deeply investigate a play style and I think do a pretty good job of laying down some groundwork and how to do that play style well. I think there's a lot you can do to Thief to make it a much better game, as with every game I've ever worked on. Uh, but I think we did a good job of laying some groundwork and doing some investigation of, of how immersive stealth works. That stated, players kind of have to buy in. And that's because we felt to get players being stealthy, as I, you know, I was talking about moving that center region of the tension and, and getting rid of the boring space and keeping the interesting space, 
that means we need an environment where you're not that powerful. Because if you're too powerful, that just doesn't work. Because you can just walk over things. And suddenly our ability to force you out of your comfort zone and react goes away. And if we can't make you react, then you're not in this situation and the tension goes away and so forth. So we had to really focus down a lot of that stuff and that really required buy-in from the player. It requires us to do a lot of work training the player and trying to get the player to, to understand the mechanics here were a little different than, than what they were used to. And I think what you lose essentially is A, you lose some players. B, you have to follow through, which means you can't do, you know, attempts to do things outside of Thief's focus did not work well in the game, as those of you who played the game know. And it meant once we'd sort of set up a, pr a set of principles for the game, hey, the narrative's out of the way. It's not, the player's not, no chance, nothing, get it into the cutscene. We were stuck to that. And that meant that attempts to change that didn't work very well, and design ideas that were very cool that we all liked had to go away. So I think we definitely made a lot of trade-offs because we, 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 we lost a lot by, by focusing that much because we needed to force the player. Conclusion. Sorry. Just ignore all that. <laughs> We're halfway to next year's version. So in closing, we just wanted to go over a couple of themes we expected to reoccur. We will, I guess, see as we go through these whether we discuss these topics. I mean, the, the, the key to remember here is, you know, this, is, this was sort of a reenactment of the kind of conversation that we have. I mean, maybe everybody has this, and, and you know, we're just fooling ourselves. But the, the, the idea here was to show how a, a casual conversation can can go from the very concrete to talking about some specific or some, some abstract issues that you can then apply to any game. Theoretically, at least. Theoretically, yeah. We'll see if it works. So, so here are some of the themes just to sort of try to clarify and give some solid, somewhat coherent concepts about differences in the two games that although, as we said, we're sort of superficially similar, obviously have a bunch of real differences. We have the player and character skill power issue. We have Thief's focus on geometry and exploration as its gameplay as opposed to DX's sort of the object and the characters and the tools and how you pick and choose amongst them are really crucial to the gameplay. We have Thief's focus on inventory as a short-term permission chance to do a special little get out of jail free card essentially, which Warren is upset that he doesn't know how to, when to use, versus the full on Get, collect it through the game, power up, make it your character, RPG inventory of DX. Would you like the next two? Ah, you're doing great. Uh, we have this, this DX model where you have this very broad space, tons of stuff going on, threads all over the place. And although the self-expression is limited, you can't really impact very much of it. You can choose where to place your focus which gives you a lot of sense of control. Versus Thief, which gets its sense of control from giving you a lot of very specific self-expression, but in a very narrow space of gameplay possibilities. We have this too. There you go. <laughs> and, and the humorous thing is the next slide. You're gonna make me hit the next slide. I am gonna make you hit the next slide. This is the stuff we thought we weren't gonna get to. Forget about the dozen slides we didn't even yet to talk about earlier. So right here's the three <laughs> other one try. hour talks. Don't even try. There you go. Uh, thank you very much. I think we're totally out of time. Go to the next slide. Go to the next slide. Go to the next slide. I don't think we have time. Yeah, I think that's it. We're sorry, it's, we're, it's we're 4.30, done. we have to go. <laughs>